Dr. Ken Landa, thanks for watching. Let's talk about Seroquel. Comes in two forms, immediate release and sustained release or extended release. Pill is known as ketiapine. It's an atypical antipsychotic developed in 1985. The Food and Drug Administration granted marketing approval for the first drug, the immediate release form, in 1997, went off patent in 2012. The sustained release or extended release form granted marketing approval 2007, off patent 2017. Structurally, the drug is related to Zyprexa and Clozapine. It's among the top 100 prescription agents used in the United States with about 9 million prescriptions every year for the drug. That increased from about 1,500 prescriptions in the year 2000 up to a million prescriptions in 2012 to almost 9 million by 2016. And that level has not been matched by any other atypical antipsychotic, which is especially of note when you consider that the only approved indications for the drug are for schizophrenia and for bipolar disorder the mania or the depressive episodes, and it can be used in treating major depressive disorder when it's added to an antidepressant. In other areas of the world, for instance in Australia, it's also approved for generalized anxiety disorder and treatment resistant depression. The dose of the medicine depends on the disorder and depends on the age of the individual. So if we're talking about schizophrenia, the starting dose for adults would be 300 milligrams increased to between 400 and 800 milligrams for maintenance dose, but adolescents between 13 and 17 start off at 50 milligrams, and then the dose is rapidly escalated to the adult dose on days three and four and five. If a person suffers from bipolar mania and is an adult, can be treated either with the Seroquel by itself or as an adjunct to lithium and valproate, Adults begin at 300 milligrams and again go to between 400 and 800 milligrams as a maintenance dose, but adolescents, say between the ages of 10 and 17, they begin at 50 milligrams and go to a maximum of 600 milligrams for bipolar disorder with the depressive episodes. We'll start at 50 milligrams and go to a maximum of 300 milligrams for geriatric patients people over age 65, then the starting dose is again very low, 50 milligrams, titrate slowly, especially in people who are debilitated or who are predisposed to low blood pressure. Have to be very careful in the pediatric population because the drug is not approved and doesn't seem to work for people who suffer from bipolar disorder, the depressive episodes. Anyway, in diagnosing and treating children, treating pediatric population, the diagnoses are very complicated, so it wouldn't be bad to get several opinions. People who have liver impairment, again, start with a relatively small dose. Comes in multiple different dose forms, 50 milligram, 150 milligram, 200, 300, 400 milligrams. You swallow the medicine whole, you don't split it, you don't chew it, you don't crush it. You take it with food or a light meal because it's better absorbed with some fat in the diet. If you're taking the extended release, you only take it once a day, preferably at night. If you're taking the immediate release, you have to take two or maybe three pills a day. During maintenance therapy, periodically you reassess to decide if you really need to continue taking the drug. If you stop the drug for any reason for more than a week, you have to start on the titration that we just talked about. You don't start at the maintenance dose all of a sudden. If you happen to be taking the immediate release form and you want to switch to the extended release form because you don't want to take the two or three pills a day, you just add up all of the pills that you take, add the milligrams and take that as a single shot of the extended release. There's no information, unfortunately, about switching from one atypical antipsychotic to another or even combining the atypical antipsychotics, which is generally thought of as not being such a great idea. There's a black box warning, especially for elderly people with dementia-related psychosis, that there's increased mortality, but also increased suicidal thoughts and behavior in children and adolescents and young adults on short-term studies. So you have to monitor people who are beginning therapy to make certain that they don't become suicidal. 
certainly can interact with a variety of other medicines. So for instance, if you're taking a medicine that acts to inhibit a drug metabolizing enzyme known as 3A4 in the liver, you have to reduce the dose of Seroquel by five-sixths. So in other words, you only take about 16% of your dose if you happen to be taking it with ketoconazole, with itraconazole, or with certain HIV medicines. And then when you stop those medicines, then you go back to your regular dose. And you have to increase the dose of medicine five-fold if you happen to be on chronic therapy with, say, St. John's Ward or Lytantin or Tegretol or Rifampin. And you have to be cautious of taking it with medicines that lower the blood pressure because already the medicine has a tendency to reduce your blood pressure and it can antagonize the effects of levodopa and other medicines that are used to treat Parkinson's disease. Now it has warnings and precautions saying that you know if you are elderly and you have those dementia related psychoses well there can be about a 60 to 70 percent increase in mortality from cardiovascular disease from heart failure and sudden cardiac death and infections aspiration pneumonia being the most common. And it can lead to an increase in cerebrovascular disease in the elderly individuals, stroke and transient ischemic attacks. Can lead to thoughts of suicide, even behavior related to suicide, worsening of depression. Can lead to emergence of suicidal actions. So the family and the caregivers have to be notified if the person's taken to watch the person, especially if the person starts to develop some symptoms that are unusual for them, anxiety or panic or agitation or insomnia or hostility or impulsivity or restlessness. And doctors should be very careful about the number of pills that they give to people because these pills can be dangerous in overdose. So in those people who are susceptible, very low number of pills may also cause a condition known as the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It's potentially fatal. It causes the body temperature to increase, the muscles to become rigid. It causes irregularity of the pulse or the blood pressure, causes sweating and arrhythmias, can cause muscle breakdown, increase in the CPK and the myoglobin. And it can cause rhabdomyolysis, breakdown of the muscle tissues that leads to acute renal failure. Times it's confused for pneumonia or infections or heat stroke. Pregnancy, there is a problem that if the woman is taking the drug during the third trimester, then the fetus or the newborn can demonstrate the extrapyramidal symptoms or withdrawal reactions. That's obviously a significant problem, but this drug might be better than some of the other drugs that are also used for schizophrenia or for a significant bipolar disorder. We don't have any good data regarding the major birth defects or miscarriage rate associated with the drug, but we do know that the risks of undiagnosed and untreated major depressive disorder and schizophrenia and bipolar disorder can be significant in pregnant women. The drug shouldn't be used for lactation since it is excreted into the breast milk. There are metabolic changes associated with taking the medicine, so it increases the blood sugar, can lead to ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar coma or even death. And people who are susceptible, they may develop diabetes and demonstrate an increase in fluid intake, increase in the urine output, increase in the amount they eat associated with weakness, about 12% within 12 weeks are going to go from borderline elevated blood sugar to the diabetic level of blood sugar, also alters the lipid level, can increase the weight, so the cholesterol goes up to more than 240, and the LDL, the bad cholesterol, goes up to more than 160, and the triglycerides go up to more than 200, about 10, 20% of the individuals, and somewhere up to 20% of the individuals going to gain more than 7% of their body weight by the time only two months has gone by of taking the medicine. They also can develop a condition known as tardive dyskinesia with potentially irreversible abnormal movements. It tends to be associated with a longer course and a higher dose, but can occur at any dose for even a short period of time. And it doesn't even matter if you've stopped the medicine. The condition persists will can lead to orthostatic hypotension. So you stand up and your blood pressure falls, you become dizzy and your heart rate goes up and you have fainting episodes and you can fall. 
It means you have to use a special caution if a person has a history of coronary vascular disease, has a heart attack or has had heart failure. And people who are predisposed to hypotension seem to be especially at risk. So those people who are dehydrated, people taking antihypertensive medicines. And then the medicine just has a tendency to make you sleepy. And if you add the sleepiness and the tendency to postural hypotension, you can have a significant problem with falls and fractures and everything else. So that's a problem. And especially in the pediatric age group, we know that children and adolescents have a tendency to develop high blood pressure. So the systole for the upper number goes up more than 20 points in about 5 to 7 percent of the individuals, but the lower number, the diastolic pressure, goes up by more than 10 millimeters mercury in almost half of the people. You can even develop a hypertensive crisis while you're taking the medicine. It's also associated with significant decrease in the white blood cells, the neutrophils, the cells that fight infection. A person can even develop fatal agranulocytosis where you're not making any of the white cells. You have to caution and use caution in people who have a low white count to begin with or a history of a low white count associated with different kind of medicines. You should monitor the person before they start taking the drug and then after a short period of time to make sure the white count is stable. Dogs can develop cataracts. We don't know about people, but it's suggested because of lens changes that you have a slit lamp examination before therapy and about every six months while you're on therapy. But even more concerning is the likelihood of what we call QT prolongation. That has to do with the electrical activity of the heart. And we can measure it on an electrocardiogram. Now, concurrent illnesses and medicines that are known to alter the electrolytes can predispose to this prolonged QT. And then if you add the Seroquel, especially if you're also taking a drug like amiodarone or Sotolol or any of the other atypical antipsychotics or Levaquin or Cipro or Erythromycin or a tricyclic antidepressant like Amipraline, uh, if you're taking Quinidine, if you're taking Procanamide, well, you have to be extremely cautious. You have to be cautious to make certain that the potassium level isn't too low, the magnesium level isn't too low. You don't even have a slow heart rate. And certainly, caution if you have a congenitally prolonged QT, if you have history of heart disease, heart failure, heart muscle disorder, if you're an elderly individual. All of those predispose to this situation that can lead to severe cardiac arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. The drug also can cause seizures, so we have to use caution, especially if a person has a decreased seizure threshold. A person over age 65, a person with a history of seizures, a person who has Alzheimer's disease, and thyroid function is depressed by about 20 percent in somewhere around 2 to 5 percent of individuals within the first six weeks of taking the drug. And then it can lead to hyperprolactinemia. That's especially in children where we have a problem where about 10 percent of girls and about 10 to 15 percent of boys develop elevated level of prolactin. Prolactin is a chemical that's made by the brain that tends to cause enlargement of the breast and in young boys that's obviously a significant problem. It causes that because it antagonizes the dopamine receptor. So when you have elevated prolactin that can lead to production of breast milk. It can cause a decrease in reproductive function. It can cause a decrease in the production of sex hormones, amenorrhea, impotence, and of course it can lead to a decrease in the bone mineral density. And it's estimated that as many as one in three breast cancers are at least in part dependent on prolactin. So at least in mice and rats, we know that Seroquel can increase the incidence of mammary gland adenocarcinoma cancer. The mammary gland, which is the equivalent of cancer of the breast, also cause pancreatic uh, islet cell neoplasia in rats. Don't know about in humans. Well, can lead to cognitive impairment. That's a significant problem. It leads to somnolence in somewhere between a quarter and a half of all of the people who take it. And again, that can lead to falls and impaired judgment and thinking. It can lead to some problem with motor skills. It can lead to problems if you happen to try to drive a car 
and it can cause problems in body temperature regulation. So you have to be especially careful that your body temperature doesn't go up too high, especially if you exercise strenuously, you're in a hot, humid environment, you're dehydrated, or you're taking an anticholinergic type medicine. And in some people, it causes dysmotility of the esophagus, it causes the esophagus not to work right, which means the food doesn't go down, which means that you have an increased incidence of aspiration, and that's a common cause of morbidity and mortality, especially in people who have Alzheimer's disease. And we know that it has anticholinergic effects, and anticholinergic effects can lead to constipation, and can lead to urinary tract obstruction, and can lead to elevation of intraocular pressure. So all things to consider. Well, the standard side effects are somnolence, and as I say, between a quarter and a half of all of the people, dry mouth and about a third of the people, leads to dizziness and about 10% of the people, and then a significant percent of the people are going to have dyspepsia, problems with their swallowing, indigestion, restlessness, anxiety or tremor, muscle spasms, are going to have trouble with their peripheral vision, peripheral edema can develop, shortness of breath, people develop peculiar nightmares or priapism, or they get up at night and sleepwalk. Interestingly, even though the medicine was brought on the market in 1997, it wasn't until 2005 that the Food and Drug Administration, without fanfare, labeled the drug that, well, you know, when you take this in combination with a series of other drugs, drugs I just mentioned with the QT syndrome, it could be linked to arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Now, they don't use the word sudden cardiac death, but at a low dose, it increases the sudden cardiac death rate by about 60%. A high dose increases it by about threefold, 300%. So obviously, significant problem. And that was only added after a big fight at the Food and Drug Administration. It can also lead to extrapyramidal syndrome, extrapyramidal syndrome tremor and drooling and cogwheel rigidity and dystonia and spasm of the neck that can lead to some tightness of the throat, even difficulty breathing and sticking the tongue out. Well, if you take the Seroquel, it can interfere and cause a false positive urine test for methadone and for tricyclic antidepressants. The Food and Drug Administration has what they call the adverse event reporting system that's voluntary, so there's a lot of under-reporting. And even though things are reported, there's not necessarily a cause and, reflect, a cause and effect. But with Seroquel, with the uh, ketiapine, there have been over 50,000 reports of serious injury and about 10,000 associations with death reported. Well, if a person has renal impairment, you need a slightly reduced dose. If you have liver impairment, since it's extensively metabolized in the liver, you have to have a lower dose or stay off of it. It's unfortunately used off-label for a significant number of medical disorders, ranging from generalized anxiety disorder to simple anxiety, or eating disorders like anorexia nervosa and anger management and dementia and sleeplessness and insomnia. It's used for post-traumatic stress disorder and personality disorder. It's used for autism and behavioral and psychological symptoms that are associated oftentimes with dementia. It's used for substance abuse and erectile dysfunction, used for poor appetite and off-label still. It's used for borderline personality disorder and the psychoses associated with Parkinson's disease and it's used in conjunction with the SSRIs, the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors for obsessive compulsive disorder and for Tourette syndrome. And we find that about a quarter of the patients who happen to be in residential senior care facilities are getting this kind of medicine. It's often associated with fatal pneumonia, associated with stroke and hip fracture and cognitive dysfunction, inappropriate use of the medicine. This medicine is often used, misused, abused. It's given to inpatients and people in chronic care facilities and prisoners to keep them in order. The misuse can sometimes be oral, sometimes people sniff the drug, sometimes they use it intravenously, sometimes they mix it with other illicit drugs. It actually has street names. It's called Quell or Suzy Q or Baby Heroin. When it's mixed with cocaine, it's called a cue ball. Mixed with THC, tetrahydrocannabinol, it's called a MAC ball. This is a drug, remember, 
for schizophrenia and for bipolar disorder and for major depressive disorder. Yet two-thirds of the initial prescriptions are written by general practitioners who have minimal training in psychiatry and little understanding of the potential downside of these kind of medicines. Now, interestingly, it's not used for treatment of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder in the majority of people who are taking the drug, even though those are the only indications. It's used at low dose, typically between 25 and 200 milligrams. Actually, 25% of the patients are getting just 25 milligrams, and that dose is only meant as a titration. It's not meant for people to be on at a routine drug level, drug amount. And the doctors who are giving the drug out think that, well, geez, at a low dose, it isn't going to cause the side effects. But it does cause the same side effects, oftentimes in the same amount. Now, between the years 2000 and 2011, there was a twofold increase in the number of people receiving the atypical antipsychotics, and the one that rose the most was Seroquel. And it's not because people were switching from other drugs to Seroquel, and it's not because we've changed the way we diagnose psychiatric disease, but here in the United States, by 2010, this drug was the fifth leading prescription in the United States bringing in almost seven billion dollars a year and of course the drug manufacturer AstraZeneca well they had charges uh, false and misleading information being provided to the medical profession about the risks they had problems with their marketing material there was an onslaught of litigation federally and from a state level from counties individual patients but the company claimed that hey we have First Amendment rights to go and promote the drug the way we want, the way we think it's uh, appropriate to promote it. Well, by the year 2011, they had over a billion dollars in settlements with the government. Actually, one lady who was taking a low dose, 100 milligrams a day, said she was walking around smacking her lips and puckering her lips like a fish and repetitively licking her lower lip. She had marked deterioration in the quality of life taking this drug. Well, the company pays doctors to put their names on articles that they, the company has ghostwritten. They pay doctors to lecture others. They pay what they call thought leaders. There's direct to consumer advertising, false claims made to doctors. The drug's used for insomnia at a dose of 25 to 100 milligrams. There's no evidence that it works. It does indeed have sedative and hypnotic properties, just like an antihistamine, anti-serotonin drug. But on systemic reviews, there is absolutely no evidence that this drug should be used for insomnia unless a person has bipolar disorder and or schizophrenia and then used to treat those diseases and just as a side benefit have some improvement in the sleep. But at a recent study in Madigan Air Force Base, or Army Base, I'm sorry, they found that the most common indication for Seroquel, the most common prescription for Seroquel was for insomnia, 57% of the people, and for anxiety, about 20% of the people, and in fewer than 10% of the people, the drug was used for appropriate indications. Now, as an example, there was a study on the drug for borderline personality disorder. The company, AstraZeneca, sponsored it. It was headquartered at the University of Minnesota, where Dr. Charles Schultz was the head of psychiatry. Supposed to be an eight-week trial, supposed to involve 100 patients, supposed to take two years to finish. But they had a terrible problem with recruitment. They had a lack of oversight. They had, among the participants, two patients who were in a residential treatment facility for sex offenders who didn't have bipolar disorder, oh, I'm sorry, didn't have borderline personality disorder, but they got into the study and actually one of them was acting as a cook for the facility and stirred his Seroquel into oatmeal that was served to a bunch of other individuals, both patients and staff. They thought there was something funny about the way they felt, something peculiar about the color of the oatmeal. Well, the outside experts excoriated the university. This is a major university, the University of Minnesota. Excoriated for lack of oversight, inadequate care of the patients, lack of control of the medicine. It was so bad that 
the state commissioned a review and as a result Dr. Schultz stepped down and the psychiatric department was banned from conducting further drug studies. Well, the studies for schizophrenia, does it work? It's modest improvement. Yes, indeed, it does work in some patients. They don't return to normal. It's helpful for the positive symptoms, the people who have the delusions and hallucinations and the excitement and the grandiosity and the hostility and the aggressive behavior. That's due to its action in blocking dopamine in the mesolimbic pathways of the brain. And it's helpful for the negative symptoms, the symptoms of the blunted affect and uh, being socially withdrawn and emotionally withdrawn, difficulty in abstract thinking. That's due to the blocking of serotonin in the frontal cortex. Well, so the drug seems to be good. On the other hand, on careful evaluation, definitive conclusions aren't necessary because of the number of people who withdrew from the studies and the lack of data regarding the economic outcomes and the social functioning of the patients and the quality of life of the patients. Well, how about does it do better for bipolar disorder? Well, actually, Seroquel is the first drug that was approved for both the depression and the mania associated with bipolar disorder. So for the acute mania, it can be used as a sole therapy or can be used adjunctively with lithium or valproate. Studies are relatively short term. Studies are relatively small. There is benefit, yes indeed, but it's certainly not a home run. And the same thing for the depressive disorder associated with bipolar disorder. Now, we have major depressive disorder by itself, not associated with bipolar disorder. And it can be used as adjunctive therapy, not as sole therapy. The company keeps trying to get the drug approved as sole therapy. But as of April of 2019, the advisory committee to the Food and Drug Administration again said, no, this is not appropriate. We are concerned about the safety of the drug and we are concerned about the sudden cardiac death associated with the drug. So no, you do not have permission to market the drug as sole therapy for major depressive disorder. Major depressive disorder is being diagnosed phenomenally commonly among people between the ages of 25 and 44. It's estimated that somewhere around 10% of men and up to 25% of women suffer from major depressive disorder, and that includes a quarter of the people who have cancer or diabetes or heart disease or have had a stroke. So we have a problem with diagnoses and we have a problem with therapy. This is an awful area of medicine. There's a problem with overdose of the drugs. So if you overdose on the drug, it could increase your heart rate, decrease your blood pressure, could cause some problems with sedation and drowsiness. That can go on to delirium and sometimes coma. Sometimes people develop arrhythmia. Some people die. Actually, in Australia, it's one of the most common causes for overdose. And as a matter of fact, a very substantial percentage of the people who overdose on the medicine, overdose on the Seroquel, don't even have any approved indication for taking the drug in the first place. Now, we're not certain how the drug works, but it seems to be an antagonist of the receptors for dopamine and for most of the types of serotonin and for histamine and for noradrenaline, but it doesn't have any activity at the benzodiazepine receptor. It has antihistamine effects, sedative effects that seem to be about the same as simply taking a Benadryl or a Doxepin or an Amitriptyline, all of which would probably be a heck of a lot safer if you have a sleeping disorder than taking a Seroquel. At very low doses, it's an antihistamine. At moderate doses, then it's a serotonin receptor blocker. And at higher doses, that's when the dopamine blocking comes into effect. You have to block at least 65% of the dopamine receptors, but not more than 80%. It doesn't work well for schizophrenia if you're below 65% blockage of the receptors, but you develop too many side effects if you get over 80% of the receptors that are blocked. So very critical to get the correct dose. And if you happen to decide to stop the medicine, you have to be careful of withdrawal reactions. If you stop too suddenly, nausea, vomiting, loss of appetite, restlessness, sweating and trouble sleeping and numbness and muscle pain, it usually goes away in relatively short period of time, about a week. Rarely, some people when they stop the medicine, even if they never had a problem with psychoses, 
they could have hallucinations and delusions. Peak blood level, if you take the immediate release form, is about an hour and a half. The delayed release is about six hours. Best taken with a high-fat meal. That increases the concentration by about 25 to 50 percent inside the bloodstream. It's metabolized in the liver. The half-life uh, is about seven hours. It has a major metabolite. It has a half-life of about 12 hours. Clearance is about... 40% reduced in people over age 65. That's why we started a relatively low dose. If a person has renal insufficiency, there's about a 25% reduction in the clearance, but the dose doesn't really have to be reduced because there doesn't seem to be any change in the plasma concentration. About 70% is eliminated in the urine, about 20% is eliminated in the feces. Animals that are studied, they develop thyroid gland adenomas and mammary gland adenocarcinomas associated with the increased prolactin we mentioned and an increase in the incidence of cataracts. Well, does it work differently than any of the other atypical antipsychotics? No, it, they're all actually about the same. Little difference, but not all that much. As far as the positive symptoms, the delusions and hallucinations, doesn't work quite as well as some of the other drugs. Works a little bit better than some of the other drugs for the negative symptoms, the withdrawal, the emotional problems. For a cognitive benefit, seems to work a little bit better. Actually, in 2013, the Cochrane Collaborative Study looked at 15 of the atypical antipsychotics, and they found that Seroquel might work about 10-15% better than the Geodun. Works about as well as Haldol and Abilify works maybe slightly less than Respidol and Zyprexa. A VA study looked at people who were taking low-dose medicine. The average dose was about 116 milligrams. These people were taking 116 milligrams for an average of 44 months. And remember, there is no 116 milligram dose. They're, they're, people are supposed to be on typically average adult between 400 and 800 milligrams. These people were taking a low dose for as long as 180 months. They had negative metabolic consequences even at the low dose, and surprisingly, even 20 of the 400 or so people who were on the study, they were taking another atypical antipsychotic in addition. Now, interestingly, a company, Louis Pharmaceuticals, they purchased the right to sell Seroquel in 51 countries, including China, the United Kingdom, Brazil, Mexico, Saudi Arabia. They purchased the drug for $260 million cash, and then benefits, depending on how well they were able to sell the drug, another $270 million or so. So in other words, they bought the rights in 51 countries for around $520, $530 million. Now, in 2017, those 51 countries accounted for only $148 million in sales, and in Asia, including China, only $74 million in sales. But if we look at 2010, the drug company sold over $5 billion worth of Seroquel in 2012 globally over six billion dollars. That was the fifth largest prescription drug used in the United States, even it went off after it went off patent. Still selling billions of dollars and settling for billions on the, with the Food and Drug Administration and the government for false and misleading advertisement, for defrauding Medicaid. Still there are lawsuits being filed even though the drug has been off patent for a while and it has to do with what's known as pay for delay, the last suit filed in September of 2019. And the FDA has a revolving door where people work for the FDA, then they go to work for the drug companies. And unfortunately, sometimes when they're working for the FDA, they're not very harsh, at least as far as the drug and drug oversight is concerned. So how much does it cost? Well, you could take a month of the immediate release generic form if you got 30 of the 300 milligram form, you could go over to Costco or Walmart and buy that for $9 or $15. But if you went to CVS, it would cost you $109 with the coupon from GoodRx. If you went to Walgreens, it would cost you $121. If you got the brand name drug, it would cost $500. And if you went to Seroquel, 
the delayed response, generic form, 30 milligram, I, I'm sorry, 30 pills, the 300 milligrams, going to cost you, again, between 25 and $30, unless you go to CVS, it's $82, and if you go to Walgreens, it's going to be $160, or you could buy the name brand drug for between $650 and $700. So that's the story of Seroquel. Seroquel and its generic equivalent, ketiapine, they're very potent drugs. They have very real side effects. They do serve a purpose. And when they're used correctly, they do improve the lives of people who have schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. But unfortunately, the drugs are far too frequently used off-label and inappropriately, and they result in significant harm. And worse yet, the drugs are prescribed so frequently to the elderly in nursing homes and chronic care facilities to ease the job of the caretaker, not the patient. And these drugs should not be used routinely as a sleeping pill. So if you're receiving a drug like Seroquel, generic or name brand, or any of the other atypical antipsychotics, do make certain that you have an appropriate indication to take the drug. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Dr. Ken Landau. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Maybe consider subscribing. Appreciate your interest. See you soon.